Um, thank you everybody for joining for this second uh, construction technology quarterly. Um, I'm really excited you're here. We're also kind of mirroring this on, uh, on Clubhouse just to see how it goes. So for the folks that are on Clubhouse, I've turned it down because it's not two way just yet, but later on we'll see if we can't find a way to have uh, a Q and A with Clubhouse involved as well, because what the heck. So um, today uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of different things to go through. Um, the, the way I'd like to run this is I'll go through this so that we can get through this. There's a fair amount of ideas and analysis that, that um, we can go through. And then I honestly have open-ended Q&A at the end. I don't expect people to spend all night, but you know we've got all the time we need to go through some of this. In a couple of cases, we've made a, a couple of assumptions and, and had some fun with numbers that, that I think are gonna drive some questions. So we're gonna look, last time in December, we talked about construct contractor segmentation, really breaking down the 730 or so thousand um, companies that are in the construction industry and started thinking about it a little bit more deeply. And we pushed that a little bit further and really got into what that means. But there's another piece coming out of that also. Um, and I looked at labor and demographics and what that means for construction technology and the demand for construction technology. Coming out of that, we, we will take a look at market sizing. The market sizing is always really hard, especially, well, it's always really hard. Um, you know, we're talking about a market that's fragmented, like a lot of markets are. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's nice to know at least what scale you're talking about. So we've taken a crack at different ways of looking at, at but not only what the market is now, but what it could be, because what often happens is software creates new markets as it turns physical and, and analog processes into digital ones. Then to kind of round out the conversation, I'd like to introduce some ideas. And one of them is not really an idea so much as an update on where the world is with AI. Now that's a huge topic. So we're gonna drill in on a couple of things that are useful um, about pre-trained models and some other things that we'll see shortly. Um, next to that will be, it is, this, the, the conversation comes up over and over again about how different products are not interoperable. And we'll talk a little bit about that and introduce to some of you the idea of an of a, uh, integrated platform as a service. And the final piece is a lot of fun is this McKinsey came up with a, a, a three horizons model that I think is helpful. So what the goal here is to kind of give you some ideas and some thinking around what the industry is like and, and some ways of looking at it that hopefully are useful. And whether you're a startup, whether you're in a software company at a contractor um, or in, an investor, um, here is an, an interesting, uh, I think, way to, uh, to a bunch of interesting ways to look at, look at the market. And then at the end, look, I'm, I'm by far from the only person doing stuff like this. So there's some people I'd like to pass you off to who are doing this on a regular basis as well. Um, so let me get into it. And then again, at the end of this, we'll have, I'll try to make it more or less the hour. And we'll, uh, at the end of this, we'll have Q&A that will last as long as we need it to. So in Q4, as I mentioned before, I looked at, at the, the kind of con the, the world of contractors and how we might think about that. Because at the end of the day, pr the primary user of a lot of what construction technology is, is, is contractors, people that are putting the world up and, and putting work in place. So we looked at, at a couple of things. So the, big, the big takeaway was, you know, you hear people talk about a $1.3 trillion market and they, and unfortunately, that's not true for really anybody, um, except again, I make a joke that maybe Microsoft Excel, but for most companies, almost every company, that's not really a relevant way to look at the market. Um, you know, just breaking it in terms of, of, of type as the BLS does. Most of this data, by the way, I haven't sourced every page here. Almost all of this data comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which while imperfect is the best that we've got at the scale that we're talking. Um, so you see federal versus public and local versus commercial and residential. Um, so, you know, big numbers, but breaking it apart into pieces that are a little bit more tractable. And the thing here is they all behave differently and that's important. So we have to start breaking down our big, big number into things we can do something with and recognize they all behave differently. Part of the reason I love this um, chart is, you know, one of the reasons I started doing the construction tech quarterly to begin with was I kept hearing people talk about the McKinsey report from 2017 as received gospel. And it, it was absolutely valuable that, that they, you know, they raised the flag that there needs to be more, uh, that the productivity is not what it could be. And, and you know, it's great that it got a lot of people excited. Um, 
but it's also is uh, unfortunate that I think people sometimes um, have takes, forgive me, there were some things going on there, that people have taken that as, as received. And what you see here is that different parts of the industry are actually um, more and less productive than each other. And the, the, the takeaway for today isn't the specifics in here so much as different parts of the industry behave differently. And it's important to not take one number or one graph and paint you know, a massive group of people, 8 million and counting um, with one brush. Another way of looking at this, this, I didn't show it quite this way last time, is if you think about along the bottom of this, there's a lot going on here and there's gonna be more. So let me make sure you're oriented. Along the bottom is the size of the company. So you can see under 5%, there's about two thirds of the industry is under five people. If you look at, if you go up to under 10 people, it's you know four fifths. And then you get up to under 20 people and it's nine tenths. So very quickly you get, you get you know, all of these companies and all of this activity, you realize it's a lot of small players, which for those of you in the industry, obviously that's not news, but it's important to anchor ourselves there and realize the number of companies that are large enough to support a lot of um, software development and a lot of, sorry, more importantly, a lot of software deployments is actually smaller than we sometimes might think. And again, you hear numbers um, thrown around that are huge as if it's a wide open market. I spent 10 years in China and that happened in China all the time too. Everyone would say 1.3 billion people, this is gonna be great. But the reality on the ground is way more competitive and way more difficult. And this is an illustration of that, is that most companies with under 10 people are gonna be, going be run by Excel and are gonna be focused on cash flow and operations and not on driving towards the future. Um, there's exceptions to that, but a general rule is when you're small, um, you're focused on, on a shorter time span. Another way of looking at that is just looking at how many of these companies are there, there are. So on the cross, the top was percentages, but here, these are actual numbers. Now, I, I have a little squiggle there because it's plus or minus, things change over time, but, but giving you an idea that there's about 550 companies that are over 500 people, which is, you know, it's a large company, but it's not massive. Certainly not, we're not talking about 10,000 person companies. Um, there's only 150 or so that are over a thousand. So again, it gives you an idea of the market into which we're selling. I wanna make a point, by the way, that I'm seeing some folks in chat. Um, I'll address that later because it's just me right now. I'm not gonna be able to hop back and forth. So hopefully there's nothing pressing. But again, if you go through this, you look at the, how many are over 250. There's about 1,900. So I'm adding, of course, the 1,300, the 9, the 300, and the 155. You get to a place where there's about 20,000 companies, 21, let's call it, um, over, over, uh, over 50 people. Now, that starts to get to kind of the, the, the smallest that, that a lot of products can reasonably expect to sell. Of course, there are exceptions. There are, there are you know, mechanical contractors or pipe fitting contractors that are amazingly forward looking and so on. But nevertheless, if you think about characterizing a market, you can start to imagine for yourself, maybe I've got 20,000, 20, maybe 25,000 companies, and a lot of them are not so easy to reach. So it, it starts to add, you know, have you think about how am I gonna reach these people? And you know, if 2,000 companies, you can know 2,000, or certainly a small team can individually understand 2,000 companies, certainly 500 companies. You can individually you know, um, uh, profile them and know, know the players and so on and so forth. That's not true of 15,000. You start getting into a different go-to-market. And of course, if you wanna go bigger than that to the whole industry, it's an entirely different go-to-market. So again, looking at this quantitatively like this, we start to be able to think about the market in a different way. Similarly, you don't sell to a, a, you know, a, a company that's over a thousand the same way you sell to a company that's under 50. So again, as we think about how, how to go at this market and, and how, to, how to speak about it, it's important to understand that, that the, we all know there's diversity in there, but now you've got the beginnings of some quantification that some of these numbers are probably smaller than you might've thought they were. It's certainly smaller than I thought they were. Um, and that has an impact on how we think about the market and how we think about how people sell into it and build products for it. I've heard this a bunch of times and I wanna bring it forward here is that competition is fiercer than we sometimes feel it. If you're a smaller company or you're out doing your own thing, um, it's sometimes not obvious that there's a lot of people fighting for the same share of voice and same share of wallet. 
Um, an example of that is, you know, if you're selling into a you know, top 10 or top 50 general contractor, you may not know it, but their innovation teams are, are inundated with new ideas. And a lot of those are good new ideas. They may or may not be ready for um, prime time, but nevertheless, you know, the competition isn't only people that do what you do. At the end of the day, there's a finite number of people who are the intake kind of conduit for a lot of these large companies, and they only have so much time to think deeply about new problems and new, uh, and new approaches. So the competition that you know, when, when the number of companies is that small, the competition you're aware of is maybe just a small subset of who you're really competing against. And as you think about how you go to market and as you think about how you also on the other side, as you think about how you receive people, um, you know, thinking about differentiation and, and why someone should pay attention to you instead of something else, um, I think is critical. And again, this puts, this underlines some of what we, of why all of that's true. So, you know, the, the implication of that is, is strategy. The implication is that you're going to either want to sell to the bulge bracket, which I'm half laughingly calling the, the 500 uh, largest companies, um, or to mid-tier, but you're probably not going to be able to sell to both at once unless you've got you know a fair amount of funding and, and have are you know have got some good momentum in the market. Typically, you're you're able to be good at one or the other, and that's true across industries. It's not specific to construction, but understanding the quantities of companies we're talking about allows you to think a little bit more clearly about it, which I thought was so. So a lot of this we started talking about in December, and now you, there's a little bit more meat to it and a little bit more of what this all means. The next part here is, is new, and this is something that I've been, I've been paying attention to for a little while. The demographics um, of, of, well, everywhere really, but, but, but of, uh, of developed economies doesn't get the attention that we want it to, or that, sorry, that I think it should, because it tends to be a little bit harder to see. Um, you know, people only get a year older once a year. <laughs> so things change really slowly, but once they change, A, it's incredibly predictable. And B, you can see it coming and it's, it's essentially inevitable. These, the numbers are just too large to do very much about it. And I wanna talk before I get into the specifics is draw attention to the difference between secular and cyclical changes. And you hear this a lot in the finance world is people talk about changes that are cyclical, which are the, you know, it's what it sounds like. It comes and it goes in a four to 10 year cycle, depending on what you're talking about. Um, permanent changes though are secular. And that's important because when I hear people talk about labor and I hear people talk about labor shortages, usually I'm hearing them talk about it as if it were cyclical, often because of, you know, what happened in 2008 and, you know, we never really made up for it. But the reality is all of, all of the, the developed world is in, is in a, a secular decline in terms of, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit of what my, I mean by that. So, like I said before, you know, a lot of folks will say, and you can look along the bottom of the years and across the, you, the graph tells the story. You know, of course, there was a huge dip after 2008 that took some time to recover, and it looks very cyclical, except to say that under it is, is this, this reality that, that birth rates have not been replacement for a very long time. I, I don't even know that. I think it's the 40s in the U.S., um, no developed economy and almost no developing economies are replacing themselves. There's one or two exceptions, but typically the way, de the, the, the way demographers will measure this is per woman, just it's easier than doing it per man and, or doing it per, um, uh, per couple, because it's just, you know, that's, so they, they, this is a, a, a term of art. It isn't something I made up, but, but the, the replacement rate, some of you may know is 2.1, because it allows for bad things to happen before someone can, um, you know, have a, have a kid. Nobody's birth rate is over 2.1. As I say, there's a couple of exceptions. As a result, and this has been true for a while, no societies figured this out. It's not just a temporary thing. It's, you know, we really started to see it in Japan, but you're starting to see it in the US um, more and more. And it, in our future, within a time frame we care about, you're going to start to see what they call dependency ratio change. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But what led to where we are now is this, this kind of magical period. And it wasn't magical. We all lived through it. It was all sorts of fun, fun and games going on. But between about 1990 and 2018, the world was flooded with labor. And that mattered everywhere. It changed how, where we made things because they were, there was labor everywhere. It changed um, how we priced things. It changed all sorts of stuff. 
Um, it depressed labor costs. It allowed offshoring of production, uh, or it encouraged offshoring of production, which pulls from a labor pool that we care about. It kept inflation low, which is where we are right now. It's why people feel comfortable with, with deficits that are eye-watering. Um, it you know, kept inflation low and interest rates and also relatively easy to find labor. And the point here is if we are having, well, let me finish a point here. This is what they call a population pyramid. Again, I'll bet you most people on the call have seen this one time or another. And the thing I wanna point out, the thing that's red, uh, outlined in red here is 25 to 29, this is this year. This is the best year we're gonna have ever in terms of number of people that should be entering our industry. And even then we have a shortage. So this is the general point I'm making is it's, it's never gonna be better than right now, unless something amazing happens and, and you know, somebody ships their country over here. We're never gonna have more available labor than we do now. Now, you know, it doesn't mean it, that, that 25 to 29 bracket, they're gonna be available as labor for another 20, 30 years, but behind them are people that are, that are increasingly shrinking, even as that's happening around the world. So the, the, the point, hang on a sec, that we're getting at is, you know, apart from the fact that we had a rough 2020, everybody was talking about over 300,000 openings. So this is across the construction industry. You can break it apart with your own, your own experience, but the reality is it's been going up even as more and more people were, were in the marketplace. So what that says to us um, is that when, that, when that when that reverses and we have fewer people, we're gonna have even more of a, of a um, labor shortage. A lot of people on this call will say things, have, have heard this sort of thing before. And so now you kind of have some of the numbers behind it. And more to the point, the background noise of all of that, the background context is that that era is ending. So China is no longer, the one, policy, one child policy right now is starting to really bite on their labor, labor market. Gen X now is, is kind of, you know, uh, boomers are retiring and Gen X is too small as a cohort to replace them. So the net number of workers is, is, is in the beginning stages of really kind of declining. Western Europe, they have the same issue where their, their post-war generation, I don't know if they call them boomers or not, but are also retiring. Um, and they've pretty much integrated that big influx of Eastern European labor as well. And at the same time, you know, for the last four years, there's been a real push towards reshoring um, industries that are, have been you know, doing things overseas. COVID just made that even more um, of, a, of an impetus because everybody wants their supply chains to be more resilient and less, less only focused on cost, which means you're gonna see people that may have made the choice to be in a, uh, in a trade, go do something similar actually in a, in a manufacturing, especially advanced manufacturing, um, which you're seeing more and more of. And I think that's gonna continue. Um, certainly both presidents, the, the, the past one and the current one have, have you know, done what they what they can anyway to or some of what they can to reshore some of this um, some of these construction competitive industries so the effect is that labor competition will increase the costs of labor are likely to increase and the need to attract labor will will obviously increase but for construction technology that also means that we're not going to have enough or construction as an industry is this problem isn't going away generally speaking we're going to have fewer working age people so what you're seeing here is a um, a graph that shows what they call, well, it's called a few things, but one of them is the dependency ratio. So the number of people, percent of the population that's working, I'm sorry, this isn't actually the dependency ratio. It's just the percentage of the population working. Um, I didn't do dependency. That's not what we're talking about today. But it gives you an idea that, that the, the percentage of the population working is, is already kind of in, in what we call, as I mentioned before, secular decline. And what you're seeing mostly here is the boomers retiring, but that's going to continue to be the case um, as the generation behind ge the millennials um, starts get entering the workforce because they're a smaller generation. So hypothesis here, pretty strongly borne out by you know, the iron law of demographics is construction is unlikely ever to have enough skilled labor. And it's unlikely to get, become smaller as an industry. So we're gonna have to figure that out we're going to have to look elsewhere. You know, we are going to need every person we can find to be a skilled laborer, to be a pipe fitter, mechanical contractor, and so on. But no matter how hard we try, we're going to have to look elsewhere. So that brought me to the next thing. What do you do about that? So obviously, continuing to do um, 
recruiting and, and arguing that this is a great job to be in will continue, but at the, the tide that you're fighting against is, is a little inevitable. And I think you're gonna start finding more and more pressure for other, if, and there already is pressure, but more and more pressure for how can we make up for the fact that we can't find the skilled labor that we need, people with seven, eight, 10 years experience. So I kind of looked at what are the inputs to job, to make, to getting a job done, to job completion. You can cut this a lot of different ways, but here are four pieces that come together. The available human labor is what we've just spent 10 minutes talking about. Um, and we, you know, I've kind of established that that is in decline. But you can look at how those, that labor is working. Is the process being re-looked at? You can look at how skillful somebody needs to be. Do you need to have 10 years experience? Right now you do for a lot of different things, but are there ways of reworking the, the process so that that's less true? And then of course there's automation, uh, which as a lot of people that have tried automation will tell you is a good idea that is way harder to do than it, than it sometimes can seem. So let's break these apart and kind of, and look at each of them. Worker skill level and technology, you're already starting to see, unions are fantastic about this. I, I personally know the UA pretty well and the MCA are doing amazing things in terms of training. But from a technology standpoint, you're starting to see virtual reality simulations and, and things like apprenticeships that are technically, um, technologically supported, learning paths and other e-learning. So outside of construction, lots of industries have spent a lot of time and money on, on e-learning and, and how, to, how, to, how to promote learning at scale. And I think you're gonna find more and more attention on this so that we can potentially collapse the amount of time it takes someone to get to a given level of, um, a given level of skill and, and competence. And, and compressing time to competence is actually a huge measure in the e-learning world. I've spent a little time there and I'm happy to bore you to tears about it. Um, Training is one thing, and that generally when we talk about training, we mean things that aren't on the job. The other side of it that you're seeing in the job site already, and I think you're going to see more of this, is performance support. And it's what it sounds like. It's helping people do their job while they're doing their job. Um, and I think, you know, augmented reality overlays. Right now, the problem is most, most things you can use that you, like, you know, hang on your, on your hat or your hard hat don't work well in sunlight. And we know that some pretty big companies are working hard to make this, uh, to solve that problem. Unlikely that, that anyone other that, that doesn't, you know, isn't named Facebook or Apple is gonna solve that on the hardware side. Um, but on the software side, there's gonna be enormous opportunity to figure out how to give people just what they need right when they need it. Probably part of that or in complement to that are AI assistants that understand what's going on and understand the context. And then finally, you know, tablet AR. These are just some ideas, but, but the, the point is, I think you're gonna find more and more pressure from, from what we see in demographics to innovate and make the most of the labor that we do have, both elevating you know, labor a little bit earlier, which you've seen in managerial ranks across the economy, but also um, helping people to do things right out of the gate that maybe are a little bit less demanding, a little bit less um, risky. The next piece that, that we've, you know, in that little triangle there or quadrangle, was process design and, and, and how does technology lean into that? Now, lean construction has been around for a while and I think that it's, be, it's increasingly being adopted, but process redesign gets done outside of construction constantly, constantly. People are looking at, at how things have been done. I mean, a lot of that happened in the 90s and into the, into the early noughts in terms of manufacturing, but I think there's a lot of, of room for that in construction, both to, for efficiency on its own, but also how do, we, how do we maximize the use of our scarce skilled resources? Um, some of that can be turning things into factory processes as well. I use this word stratified process to say, you know, sometimes you're gonna have, you're gonna identify things that require the, the, the kind of the, the highly, highly skilled person and other things that don't, whether that's some fabrication or whether that's, um, you know, anyway, some prep and so on. That already happens, of course it does, and it's probably happened for a thousand years, but I think it becomes more critical now as we rethink how processes work, again, to really elevate the, the skilled worker that, that is going to be increasingly more scarce. Um, technology products, uh, you know, what, what can help with that? So are we able to simplify the products that people are putting in? Are we able to simplify assemblies that require a little bit less skill? I, I, I think this is an opportunity. 
Um, and then of course, factory produced sub-assemblies. The final one is automation. Now, the problem with automation is it implies that, that things are so regular that a non-AI can handle it, or you've got things that are a little bit less regular that an AI can handle. But I think you're gonna find things like robotic transport and some site operations. No robot that's been, that I've ever heard of or even heard people talk about can do what a human can do in terms of flexibility and ability to just handle stuff as it comes your way. Um, nevertheless, there are a lot of things that require human labor that I think we'll, we'll see automated. Um, things like resource allocation, paperwork and information. I think there's a, there's a term robotic process automation, which I think you're gonna see more and more of. There's some folks doing that already, um, where you just automate things so that, so that skilled labor can do their jobs instead of the things that support their jobs. Then there's offsite automation. So whether it's production, planning, transportation, materials prep, Again, I think the pressure to do this more and more um, will just continue to increase as we see those demographic trends kind of bite. Last time I talked about this idea that had come from um, Chris Mayer, who, who spent some, was the, the, the uh, chief innovation officer of, of Suffolk in the, in the past. Um, he talked about, and I, I just I have to give credit where credit is due, that a lot of the technologies we focus on right now are, um, are about, about supporting what field labor does, but not actually helping them put work in place. And I think that demographics and labor supply point towards the, the need to develop technologies that help with putting work in place. And again, make the most of the labor that we do have and the, the skill sets that we do have. So summarizing this, these two pieces um, is, you know, there are about 20,000 companies large enough for a lot of what, a lot of new products. Now it doesn't mean that, the, that you can't come up with something that smaller companies will find value in, of course you can. But generally speaking, people need a little bit more um, kind of free cash flow and, and, and uh, have, have a little bit of a managerial layer to be able to pull in, you know, listen to you talk about new products and spend time to really learn them. Um, so, you know, and I hear this a lot that about 400 companies get most, i.e. the ENR 400, get most of the attention. I think we need to find ways to reach the other 19,600, again, plus or minus. Um, and I think you're going to see more and more people thinking about how to do that. Um, you know, the other side of that was labor. Labor is running out. Um, it, I mean, we're not going to actually run out, but it, you're going to find that, that the, the, the troubles that we were hearing about prior to the pandemic are not only going to come back, but are, are likely to get worse. So we need to find ways to maximize labor skills and also minimize the level of skill needed where possible. In some places that's not possible, but sometimes it will be. And of course, you have to continue to recruit and try to get youth into the industry. But just at the end of the day, it's demographics are very hard to fight against, especially when there are, are not only demographics, but likely to be other demands on that, on that pool of skilled labor. So that's, that's one big kind of chunk uh, that I wanted to share with everybody and, and trying to figure out what's going on in this big industry of ours. As if that wasn't enough of a bunch of risk for me to take in terms of some, some leaps, uh, I figured I would try something even more fun and look at how can we figure out the size of the construction technology market. So anyone who's ever tried to actually size a market will tell you, especially one this big, this, this fractured and this um, kind of unstudied for lack of a better word, will tell you it's hard. Um, there's no freely available studies. People like, like when the Procore did their S1, their, their, their uh, SEC filing, they paid somebody to do it and they came up with a number that unsurprisingly supports their S1's thesis. It's the point of doing things like that. Nevertheless, I do reference that because it's, it's, you know, it's a valid study. We can't just throw up our hands. We've got to go try, try with the available data and I'll tell you what my assumptions were along the way. The goal with this is just like it was with the, the kind of picture of contractors and picture of labor is to try to understand how much money are we even talking about and then try to understand at least a little who else is in there playing that makes it even harder? <laughs> um, and you'll see, we kind of go back and forth. So back of the napkin, which is, you know, again, the starting point here, Deloitte put out, put the industry's spending at about 1.5% or 0.1, isn't that relevant for us right now? It's worth noting that's a survey of CIOs and they didn't go down to 50 person companies. They, they, they're, so let's assume these are that 1.5 is, is good for larger companies. So again, you guys can run these numbers on your own I, I think it gets us somewhere to say 
the 440 billion is the sales of the ENR. This they publish this. If you if you add up the column in the in the ENR, they'll tell you that you know it adds up to about 440 billion. There is no source of the next 19,000. So I said, well, you know what? Let's assume it's another 400 billion because between those two, you're a little less than two thirds of that 1.3 trillion. So you're you're saying to yourself, that 20,000 is the bulk, or well, again, two thirds of the spend in the industry. Um, I think that's an okay assumption. Um, and, but again, these numbers are easy to play around with yourself. Also assume that they spend a little bit less than some of the larger companies do, which gets us to something like um, 10 and a half billion for the entire construction industry. Um, that's, a, that's a nice number. And this is for the US, by the way. Um, what does that get us to? So maybe the low estimate is 10.6 billion. Um, if I took the whole industry and applied that 1.5, you'd be at 19.5. So, you know, even if De Deloitte was right for people with two people in their company, which I think is a heroic assumption, you're still at about 20 billion. That's a nice number, but it's, it's you know, it's not, Apple makes more than that in half a quarter. So it's worth keeping in mind the, the pool we're talking about. And, you know, I, I, do, I have no idea where the, the 2 billion is me taking Procore saying that they think they're gonna get to, this is in their S1, about 9 billion in their total sales and they assume a lot of that's overseas and I, you know, I don't wanna assume too much. Let's say they took 2 billion and let's say Autodesk took another 2 billion. This is just making the back of the envelope math easy so we can do some thinking here. Um, and then we took Trimble, Oracle, Hexagon, all of them with their, with their construction side businesses. And, and let's say that's another 2 billion. The reality of IT spending is a lot, a lot more of it goes to shadow expenses like internal and salaries and all that. Let's say that's another 2 billion. That gives us a range that's pretty significant between two and a half and, and, and 11.5 billion. Big numbers, but maybe smaller than sometimes, um, sometimes people have seen. Um, the market is smaller than, than we might assume. And I'm, I'm sure there are startup pitch decks out there that, that start with no bigger numbers. And you know what, God bless if you, can, if, if you can get to a bigger number than this. But to me, it allows us to say, all right, that's where we think the world is now. The question is, you know, could that addressable market grow? And the obvious answer, that's a bit of a leading question is, is yes, it always grows. And I say that because uh, a couple things. If we assume labor is never going to be adequate and we have 300,000 shortage a year, and we know that's going to grow, but let's leave it there. And we took 70,000, assuming some people make more and a good number make less, but let's say 70,000. That means that, that we're not spending 21 billion that we would otherwise want to spend. So you're replacing labor of 21 billion. Now there's no way you get all that money. So let's say it's two thirds and now you got 14 billion. So there is the potential. And again, if you really want to do a business plan about this you might get a little more specific but as you start to think about where the market might go we know that there is a need or people wouldn't have these job openings out there. So you know that there's something like 14 billion maybe it's 10 but it doesn't matter. It's, it's a big number where the market has potential to grow to replace another input that isn't as big as we wish it were or isn't sufficient to, to, for demand. The next piece here is a little fuzzier um, because it's a little more forward looking. Some of you may have read, um, uh, Mark Andreessen wrote this fantastic piece in the Wall Street Journal in I wanna say 2011 called Software is Eating the World. And it was sort of the thesis for his new venture capital firm, which some of you may know, Andreessen Horowitz is I think the biggest there, or one of them. So clearly he was onto something. Um, they really hitched onto the SaaS revolution. But the point is eating the world means that you're digitizing processes that um, usually you're replacing larger analog costs with smaller digital costs or smaller digital earnings. But nevertheless, you've grown the digital, you've grown the software market. So if the analog market was 10 and you replace it with $5 of digital market, you now have $5 of digital market you didn't have yesterday. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for that. The issue in this little slide here is we don't, know, we don't all the way know what that's gonna be. I think that, that the, the exciting part about construction technology is we don't know what people are gonna innovate. We keep hearing you know, great ideas coming. But in the process of this, as I kind of just to summarize this, the market for software and other digital technology will, will continue to increase. And this is driven by innovation. Whereas this slide before it was driven a little bit more by um, uh, demographic trends. Here we're saying that we expect, and I expect, 
innovation to drive the, the creation of new markets as people think about replacing analog and kind of you know, physical processes with software, which is what we've seen across everywhere. And the interesting thing I wanna point out is that the hotel industry has grown along with Airbnb. I'm not gonna say that about the, the taxi industry because I'm not so sure that, that the people weren't really excited to not, not use taxis in certain towns. But it hasn't, it isn't automatically the case that, that replacing some or augmenting or replacing some things with digital processes automatically makes the old way go away. Often it's, an, it's a complement or it opens up entirely new behaviors we didn't know we had before. So a conclusion, and I, I opened this by saying, you know, it was a bit of a risk to talk about demographics. It's really a risk to talk about the numbers I just did, but I hopefully gives people the beginnings of some scale and some idea about how big the market we're playing in could be and, and is. Every market's hard to, to size, but we can start thinking about the construction technology as an established market that's highly competitive. And the reason I put Procore and, and Autodesk and the rest in there is there are very well-funded companies already in some of these, some of these uh, sectors and some of these categories, and they're not going to give up easily. So it's worth keeping in mind that it's pretty competitive. Doesn't mean some genius can't come in and, and find a better way to do it, but it's a little harder. The next one would be emerging technology that is uh, you know, new in addition to budgets. So I took out the 8 million. That's where I got this, this from. Um, I mean, I'm seeing it. Weirdly, maybe it's just who I've been talking to, a lot of Revit plugins. I think you're finding an expansion of what Revit can do. Um, there, there could be reasons for that in terms of innovation that's driven from Autodesk versus the, the, the market, but so what? There's, there's a lot of room for things like this. These are emerging technologies. They're usually pretty, pretty baked on the tech side, but not so much on the product side. And I think you're gonna see more and more of that. And then yet to be introduced technologies. I pulled the four, 14 billion there from the, the, the labor replacement because I don't have another better number. But again, it gives you an idea that, that you know, it's possible that we could as much as double the construction technology market overall through new innovation and through converting um, you know, labor shortages and um, analog processes into, um, into digital or, or technologically more sophisticated processes. We've seen that happen in industry after industry. This is an example of how we might frame out how that might work. So I'm going to give everybody a breather. Uh, there's a bunch of questions in the, in the, uh, in the chat, and I'm going to get to that when we're at the, at the end of this. So I'll, I'll make sure we have at least 15, well, let's say 10 minutes. <laughs> so that was the big chunk. So I kind of did this caveating already. I don't need to do that. So in the, in the, the, the main kind of contents, I talked about other ideas and, and things I'd love for people to hear about. So there's three of them I want to talk about. Um, and I'll talk about them relatively quickly so we can get to Q&A. Um, I wanted to update people on some, some cool things that are happening in AI. So I've, I've spent more time building on top of, of um, APIs than I have growing, a mark, growing models on my own. And that's most people's experiences that don't have Google on their, on their business card but I've done it enough to, to tell you that it, it can be really exciting and incredibly frustrating. What's interesting now is, you know, when you hear people talk about artificial intelligence, the first thing they'll often tell you is you don't have enough data. And what's exciting now, and this has been around for a while, but it's, it's maturing, especially on the NLP side, is this idea of pre-trained models, models that someone, usually a cloud provider like Microsoft or Google, They've gone and they've done the hard work. They've gathered the hundreds of millions of, of photos or videos or whatever it might be. They've, they've done the, the, the modeling and all the rest of it to make very robust uh, models that you can use in two different ways. The first one is just a direct API you plug right in that can recognize you know, dogs and cats and, and do some things in terms of uh, like for um, augmented reality, there's some things that you can pull right out of, out of these APIs. So they don't, they're not a product directly, um, but that means that as a, as a startup or even as a, a contractor, you can pull some of these APIs and build some, some solutions for yourself that do some pretty magical things. Now let's be clear, magical in this case is language and vision. Things that are more about recognizing patterns in your data, it, it, that you still do need some data for that. Um, that said, there are pre-trained pre -trained models out there that will often give you a head start so you don't have to start from scratch. This is why data, uh, data scientists are really critical to really anything you're doing, um, except for maybe, as I say, pulling an API. The second part of this, or the last kind of bullet there, is 
not only can you pull an API directly that, that will do things like recognize things and understand language and all that, but you can train it on your own data, but you don't need a lot of data. And that's the critical point here. I actually had some, some guy, this is how I spend my weekends, but I, I actually paid someone on Fiverr to go and recognize tools from, I think it was DeWalt. And I just went to a Home Depot and I took like, I don't know, 400 pictures of two or three of them. And he found it took six, between 60 and 80 photos. And mind you, I'm, I may not be the world's mo most um, accurate photographer either, but um, it took about 60 photos for it to be, to be able to recognize one tool versus another. And they're all the same color. They all have a handle. One was a drill and one was a router. I forgot what it was. The point I'm making is you don't need a ton of data. You have the levels of data that you could conceivably pay a team to go and collect for you, depending on what you're trying to do. That's really exciting. And I think we're just starting to see what that might mean. Um, these models, especially the, the, the kind of trainable model, I, I don't know how long Google's had it out, but I don't think it's more than two years. Um, and it's, it, you can, there's two vision APIs and one of them is trainable and one of them's not. And all the cloud providers do something like that. So I, I encourage you to check that out. Um, just to see, because again, I built something with not a, not a ton of money and I just tried to see. Um, so fun stuff. The next one though, is the, on the language side. So I want to quickly tell people who don't spend time thinking about what a parameter is, what we mean by parameter in this context. So you've all heard about deep learning. Deep learning basically means you've got layers of, of sets of equations. I mean, it is, you can see, you've seen the little boxes and the lines, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a sequence of, of collections of equations and equations have, you know, coefficients like, you know, A of C and B of D, whatever. So that's what they mean by parameters. So you're talking about 175 train. And the point is when you train a model, it's the parameters that get tweaked. So when you're, you know, back propagation and all that stuff, for those of you who can geek out on this, the point of here is that a couple of years ago, OpenAI came up with something called GPT-2 and everyone was excited because it did all this fun stuff. And before that even, Google came up with something called Vert. And again, everyone was excited because they trained it on like all of Wikipedia and oh my God, it's the most amazing thing ever. It's worth noting that GPT-2 had 1.5 billion parameters. That's just beyond the ability to even think of. The new one, GPT-3 has two orders of magnitude, two zeros more, uh, which is just beyond, beyond. Um, What's crazy about it is it's able to generate whole paragraphs. It can write code, like literally it can write, um, I know it can write React and it can write some other, I mean, I, that just blows my mind. It can't think, let's be clear, but it can generate without a whole lot of, of, of input, it can generate content. Think about what that starts to mean as your ability to, as, as you might want to create an, a, you know, a, uh, something to write reports or something that will be in, in a, an assistant or an agent. It's kind of amazing how to make it do exactly what you want is what products are all about. So it, right now it's hosted by Microsoft. It's available for development. I don't think it's the easy, I think you have to ask them for it. I don't believe it's an API you can just go sign up for, but that's okay. Um, there's a couple companies doing it already. And essentially what they do is you, you give GPT-3 or whatever they call the product, other side or compose, you give it a couple of sentences and it'll take those and turn it into a full email or turn it into the super powered autocomplete. Honestly, I haven't tried it yet. So right now these are all very language focused because it is language focused, but copy.ai will write a short paragraph for you. What's interesting is the earlier one, GPT-2, somebody had it write a, 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 a submission for an essay contest to the, the economist and it didn't win, but people couldn't tell it was a computer. So that's pretty amazing to me. Where this goes, we will have to see. I will tell you this, it does not, this isn't the, the first death knell and you know, the, the beginning of our robot, robot overlords. These things are still very narrow. They're very good in their little zone, but that they're only good at their zone. They can't do your taxes and they can't make decisions and they can't tell you what's good or bad. So they're still very narrow, but within their narrow zone, they're incredibly powerful. So I think you're gonna see more and more pre-trained models available to everyone from startups to contractors that wanna build their own solutions and combinations thereof. Um, yeah, I think I've kind of covered this, but for, you know, for a lot of new, new AI applications, you still need a lot of data. So a lot of people on this call might be thinking about how do I automate things like recognizing patterns in my, my data and all, you're still going to need um, a lot of data for that. That said, you don't always need it to be quote unquote AI. Sometimes statistics are already good enough, but a lot of others though, 
you're, you're, especially for language or vision, you can get a lot of what you need. And I mentioned earlier from 50 to 200 um, examples or data points, I obviously get a real data scientist to tell you the number, but the key thing is from a scale standpoint, you're not gonna look for a, you know, 100,000 or 200,000 um, data points, which is beyond the reach of most companies. Now you have the ability to collect the data you need. All right, so I'm gonna start talking a little quicker. We're almost at the end here. Um, we hear about software not talking to software all the time. I mean, one of the downsides of so much choice is different things don't talk to each other the way we wish they did. So for those of you who've never heard of it, integration platform as a service um, is, a, is a, a, an idea that's been around for a while, but now you're seeing more and more of it. And I'm seeing it in the construction industry, which is great. There are companies, big companies like MuleSoft that was bought by uh, Salesforce, Trey.io, I think around their own, Boomi is a Dell product. These are all major platforms that, that can allow large contractors to connect data flows and functions. And what that means is you can pull in different APIs from different companies and they kind of, they, they become part of an integrated whole, which is why that term integrated platform is used. Um, there are companies like Project Ready and Rivet and they're gonna kill me because they do more than this. <laughs> But their constructions, and there's more of them, that's just the two that I could think of as I was writing this, that, are, that provide both the service of helping you connect and, and, and um, do um, a level of, of consulting, but also they have a backend iPass already that, that connects this. So as you think about this pain of things connecting, know that the technology to do this is getting better. Um, the know-how of how to do it, you know, the more people do this, the, the faster and quicker and, and more efficient they are at, at doing it for you. So there is help out there. Um, this is some of why Procore has their app store is so that you can bypass this and just hook things into their, your existing Procore um, account. Same thing with Autodesk is doing this increasingly. Autodesk Revit, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't realize quite how much activity there's been, but again, that's, that's a way to, to kind of get over the silos and have data flow a little more freely. Oh, and as somebody who is, you know, uh, complete disclosure works for CSI Crosswalk. Um, I would be, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that standards and the interchanges that are, are, are being developed are also helping enormously. So um, the Construction Progress Coalition has been talking about their CDX for a number of years. It's a set of practices and standards that can help teams connect uh, data flows. That is not their copy, it's mine. So I got it wrong, it's my fault. Definitely have a look. It's, it's, they've done a lot of work with RFI specifically and, and of course other things. Crosswalk is what I spend my, my, my day job on when I'm not you know, giving these fantastic talks. Um, everything from master format, uniformat, um, all is an API. So you're starting to be able to take some of the standards people have been using for 70 years and, and you know, apply them digitally. A little bit more Europe-centric is another group called Building Smart. Um, and they, they're a little more, as I say, a little more globally focused than uh, Crosswalk. The key thing here is that there are groups out there that have solutions that are a little more specific to one kind of data or another. So people are working on this problem a bunch of different ways. So there's stuff out there to go check out. Okay, this is my last point and then I'm gonna introduce you to some of my closest friends. So McKinsey came up with an idea called their Three Horizons, uh, I don't know, five years ago or so. So this, this actually was a, a guy from Building Ventures, Greg Wallace, who by the way, did, did the, the podcast, which just came out this morning. So, you know, good timing. Um, he reminded me of this, this Three Horizons um, uh, framework, which is a cool way for people. And it relates to what we've been talking about today. How do you look at technologies over time? Everybody knows in the beginning of technology barely works, then it gets better, then it really works. This year will behave differently from five years away. And there's kind of an expression of that. Organizations, you need to think about things at different times. What are we solving right now? What are we making sure is going to be new revenue up or cost saving opportunities in the near future? And the third one is how do we make sure that we're not getting blindsided by somebody or that we are taking advantage of new, new directions and new opportunities? So those three kind of, and this is the most visual slide that I've got for those of you on Clubhouse, but there's horizon one, two, and three. And the, the idea is Horizon one is one to two years, things that you can, you can basically plan and schedule right now. This is your defending and expanding the core of your business right now, as it starts to sound very McKinsey-like as I, as I say this. Horizon two is three to five years, and that's new businesses, emerging, emerging technologies, I said earlier. And the final one is five plus years. And I, I like this, and, and it came from somebody who's a venture 
investor because that's that's a good good way to look at new technologies and new companies is who's ready to do something and, and add value today who's ready to who do we think is maturing and within two or three years or three to five years is going to have something that's really world beating and who's out there trying things that we pretty much know are going to take a while to, to gestate so as a framework i wanted to to introduce this so that as you think about what you're seeing and what you're hearing so you'll hear things like you know a fusion is always 20 years out but you know things like um, uh, AR glasses, right? That's probably three to five years. But but you know what we do with that and the the AR cloud is probably five years or more out. And the AR cloud I can't get into right now, but it's an exciting way of thinking about how AR can map to the real world. So I encourage you to check this out. There's a couple of there a couple of free reports that McKinsey put out um, that speak about this, which is is again it's just a, a nice framework um, to think about. And of course, how does that align with what we talked about above? So, you know, the near term is the existing software market I talked about that's roughly nine, nine billion or so. The medium term are those emerging, mar emer emerging products that I think was said two and a half to 11 and a half. And longer term, rethinking the processes is what I was saying is 14, you know, possibly 14 billion. Again, those are numbers that you saw how I arrived at them and they're more directional than they are something you can put on a balance sheet, but they give you an idea of scale that there's, you know, we could potentially through things that are coming and things that we're seeing develop now have the potential, I think, to dramatically expand the market. All right, thank you all for listening as long as you have. Uh, we're sort of, we're at the end here and I wanna just talk about some of the other places you can go and hear some awesome folks out there. So there are a number of groups that publish pretty awesome things. Electri is the Electrical Contractors Association, re their research uh, group. I believe there's a there's something coming out pretty soon. Um, Josh Bone is their executive director, and he told me that there's something coming. And I think it didn't quite make it for this this meeting, but I encourage you to check what they do. They they've been doing this for some time, and there's some good stuff there. If you haven't seen Dodge Analytics, um, they also do some great studies. There's a guy Steve Jones that runs that, and it's uh, just remarkable some of the insights that are in there. A little more on the paid side is FMI. Some of you may be familiar with them from the Southeast. Um, really well done, but again, often paid stuff. Uh, I don't see a ton that's free. They do have a couple of uh, reports that aren't bad. Deloitte is generally good, especially when it comes to human capital. Uh, it's just a focus that I've seen them, them look at. And then finally, McKinsey, of course, is the one that, that rang everyone's bell in 2017, but they keep coming out with good thinking. Um, it's worth translating some of that into kind of ground level reality, but, but again, they, they often come as a good consultant might come out with some frameworks that often help you to think about what you're seeing. And the final slide here is, is and again, this isn't exhaustive, it's just what I could fit on a slide. Um, the Construction Progress Coalition are doing, they do round tables, which are, are really great. Usually four, I believe four of them at a time. Go check it out next Wednesday. I can't tell you what's in there because I didn't put it here, but, but it's easy to find. Just go to Construction Progress yeah.org and you'll find it right now i think uh the construction dorks is um it's a fun group of folks that take it pretty deep um you know real construction technologists that'll that'll go into what's going on often as i say quite deep the contact crew is like the the og of of uh of talking about construction technology um bridging the gap i was on today which was kind of cool um very a little mep focused um and then also part of the construction progress coalition is the uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that didn't work. Constructed Futures is my podcast. We had a little bit of a cut and paste problem there. Um, I do that two times a week, so Monday and Monday and Thursday. Um, so hopefully some folks have enjoyed that. Usually it's 30 minutes. It's meant to be a nice quick listen. So that is the conclusion of today's Construction Technology Quarterly.